And so I want to explain a little bit about our workshop. Um, you know, the Hill District didn't have a workshop or any kind of tenant group as a whole. Now there are tenant associations like, you know, on different properties, but as a whole. And so when we were working with partners um, around the city, in particular Northside Coalition for Fair Housing, and then of course, you know, everyone knows what happened to Penn Plaza, they formed a group, and Hazelwood had a group. So I said, well, why don't we just start doing one and do one for the hill? You know, see where everyone's head is. At first, we really thought that we were going to um, be able to build tenant associations on properties that, you know, like for instance, that didn't have a tenant association. But it's kind of hard when you're a third party um, organization, or I would say it's a third party interruption because a lot of the property owners and management systems, they don't like third party people, you know, coming in. But nevertheless, I said, well, we'll have our own workshop at the Hill House because in my walk and my journey, when I found out some of those properties that do have tenant associations and groups, they're corrupt. <laughs> so I said, well, I mean, for real, what sense does that make? You know, because, you know, what is, you know, what doesn't make sense to be a part of a broken system that ain't doing that for everyone? So I decided to have our group once a month, and we are called uh, Renters Rights uh, Matter, and our slogan, our slogan is Renters Must Rise. Meaning that we have to educate and encourage one another. So, point being taken, if we put in information out there, please share. Don't like it on Facebook. I can like that. I can like my own work. Please encourage someone to come participate, especially when you know your neighbors, and you know your people, you know who's in your family. Something that they can really help because I believe, like I said, we're all human and we just need to start helping one another. And so um, we started the group and now we're into a year and a half and we've been getting um, great reviews from our funders that we're doing a good job. Um, we're um, really fulfilling what we need, what funders are questioning us about. And you guys are letting us know how we're really making a difference, and that's really making me proud, but not for me, or Carl Redwood, or Jamila, or anyone at the consensus group. Make yourselves proud. So yeah, without further ado, this evening, we have um, our guests are from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, I've been in their ear a lot and through email, and I told y'all how I stop people through email. Like my one friend just said, Carl wouldn't let it go. She was in my ear every day, every week about, I need this funding for my people. Well, I've been in their ear in email as much as I can because they're called Pennsylvanians for modern court. And I believe it's important because a lot of um, renters or tenants and landlords um, sometimes they don't get along, but in landlord-tenant relationships, sometimes the landlord has more, um, I guess, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Leverage, or I don't want to really cause a, a back and forth thing, but they have the laws kind of a little bit more on their side. So with that being said, we are working this year, hopefully, on a campaign called Right to Counsel. And so I'm stopping Duquesne University and Pitt and the other folks that I know in the legal system, in the legal world, to help that happen. Because I believe if tenants have a legal court system where they can go get help other than the little bit of help that's out there, we'll all be better. Everybody will be better. It'll be a better relationship among landlords and tenants. And so, you know, 
we just want to be able to work with landlords and everybody there together. Because at the end of the day, I tell folks, you rent even though you own, you don't really own it until you pay that last payment, like a car payment. So in some, in some circumstances, we're all renters and we have to get along with landlords and our neighbors and so on. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce the Pennsylvanians from Marlin Court from Philadelphia, and I really appreciate them, and I'm going to turn the mic over to them. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, everyone. Um, I hope you don't mind I'm going to stand, because I'm sort of an animated talker, and it's very hard to do that sitting down. So, so all of you know I am Maida Malone, and I am a native Pittsburgher, and spent all of my formative years here and love the city and our organization is a statewide organization. We just happen to be headquartered in Philadelphia but I spend a good deal of my time here in Pittsburgh and in Harrisburg and all around the state. So it's a pleasure to be here with all of you and thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, Pennsylvanians for Modern Courts, and Jamila, I guess you can move to the, the next slide. Uh, we are the only nonpartisan, nonprofit organization in the state that is committed to making sure that every one of us can come to court to find fair, qualified, impartial judges and so that all of us understand the court system, understand how it's structured and how it works, and how best to navigate all of the many courts that exist in the Pennsylvania judicial system. So that's our focus. We come um, from a, a long line, 30 years, of people who have been committed to this cause. We were founded, and this year is our 30th anniversary, we were founded by a group of judges and lawyers, uh, one of whom, Judge Phyllis Beck, who was one of our founders, she was asked by then Governor Casey to form a commission and do some research as to why the judiciary in Pennsylvania at the time was held in low esteem by many people in Pennsylvania. And what that commission discovered at the time, one of their major findings was the fact that judges in Pennsylvania, unlike most of the other states in the union, are all elected in partisan elections. And so our organization has been committed to um, moving to a new system, an appointed system, of merit selection, particularly for our statewide judges. So that's sort of the, the foundation, but over the years, what we've discovered in doing this work is that there are many reforms that need to be made to the judicial system, and there's lots of information about the courts and our many judges that people really don't know. And we find ourselves, I think each one of us has probably had that experience of having to go to court for one matter or another, a traffic violation, um, a civil lawsuit where someone's suing you, or in criminal court, or wherever, in divorce court. We find ourselves in court, but we, we only have that tiny snapshot of the court system. We don't really understand how that fits into uh, the broad landscape of the judiciary. And so we are committed to doing lots of workshops and educational programming to help everybody better understand our court system. And so that, uh, that brings us here tonight. Uh, this is why we're here as an organization doing this workshop, and we are working through many of the local community organizations because that's what we want to do. We know that community organizations are the lifeblood and they're connected to you and they know what you need and so we listened to them and um, we developed this workshop.
It's part of uh, our civic education program, and we train lawyers, and we do programming for judges, and we try to train the media, journalists, and judges, and help them understand each other better so they can report more clearly to you and help better educate the public. And then we have our PMC in the community. And this program tonight is part of our PMC Shares workshops. Those are our educational workshops. We also have PMC Watches, which is our court watchdog program, where we train community members to go in and watch what's happening in court. Uh, we've developed a tool, and we train you how to use that tool to evaluate all sorts of things about the courthouse and the court personnel and the way the proceedings are going. And then we take that information and we develop reports and recommendations on changes that might need to be made to our court system. And finally, we have PMC Listens. I think we have cards out on all your tables. It's an 800 number if you have any questions about the court system. And I have to, you know, put in parenthesis, we don't provide legal advice, right? We're not a legal services organization. We really are here to help people understand the court system and how to make the court system work better. But if you call that number, we have trained volunteers who will respond to your questions. And if you need to be referred to a legal services organization, they will help you do that as well. So, um, without further ado, I would love to introduce my colleague to you. And this is Tom Petrella. And Tom is our program coordinator, and he is a VISTA fellow, and we are so thrilled to have his services and his brilliance and all of his great support um, over a two-year period of time. You know, in these community organizations, we can't do it without great interns and great volunteers and great fellows. And so Tom is going to guide you through a pre-questionnaire that we have, and we do that, it's not a test, so nobody be nervous. I'm like the first person who gets a knot in her stomach when someone says, like, I'm gonna test you. Uh, it's not, we just really want to know whether or not this program is effective. So it's helpful to us to know what you know about landlord-tenant disputes at the beginning of the program and compare that to what you know at the end of the program. So. Tom, if you want to take that on. Good evening, everyone. Um, good evening. So in the middle of your table, you'll find the pre-questionnaire. Um, we're going to ask that you take about 10 minutes to fill that out. Um, there are questions regarding the basics of what we're going to cover tonight, and we want to see how much you already know. And um, at the end, you'll take a post-questionnaire, which will um, <laughs> See how much you have learned throughout this presentation. So just take about 10 minutes to fill out um, what you know. If you're not sure at all, you can leave it blank. So now I'm going to give you just a basic cursory um, contextual um, information about magisterial district courts. So where do landlord-tenant disputes take place in the court system? Um, as you can see, we have this lovely pyramid of hierarchy of our court system in Pennsylvania. And landlord-tenant issues start at the magisterial district level. So that is at the very level. In everywhere except for Philadelphia County, we have magisterial district courts. In, munis in uh, Philadelphia, we have municipal courts. So those are a little structured differently, um, and magisterial district courts usually handle um, more diverse cases, whereas in municipal court, they're separated into uh, landlord tenant court, into small claims court, and um, traffic court as well. So magisterial uh, district courts are headed by magisterial district judges or elected officials. Um, they comprise a variety of issues that 
come to through their doors, um, such as like tenant issues, but also small claims, which are less than $12,000. They also do some preliminary hearings um, and arraignments in uh, greater misdemeanor and felony charges, so things that are like um, more grave uh, criminal defenses, uh, uh, grave criminal issues do not go to ministerial district uh, courts. Um, there are also summary offenses, so things like traffic uh, violations, and then also issues regarding municipal ordinances. Um, so, over there we have the uh, pyramid, as I pointed out. So once a magisterial, if you go through magisterial district court, the higher levels of the court um, would be when you appeal it. So if you appeal an issue from magisterial district court or municipal court, then you move up to the Court of Common Pleas, which are more regional, regionally based, um, particularly with the judicial district. And as you move up, um, you get uh, the stakes become higher and the appeals have more weight. Um, so without further ado, I will introduce you to our guest speaker, um, Judge Oscar Petit is the Magisterial District Judge for the Hill House and Home, uh, Hill District and um, Homewood. Good evening. How y'all doing today? Well, y'all know I, I don't cover Homewood, right? <laughs> but I know the guy that does cover, cover Homewood, he's sitting back there. Judge Kevin Cooper, Jr., would you stand up, please, be acknowledged. <clears throat> Thank you very much. We're here to dispel the myth that coming to court is next to death. Because actually coming to court is a, is a very, very tough thing. But we want to make sure that if you ever have to come to court, that you are prepared, that you are not intimidated, and that you are well informed. Um, as you can see, from the diagram here, I sit in both of those courts, the Magisterial District Court and as well as Pittsburgh Municipal Court. But I don't care which court you're in, it's still all court. Um, you can appeal anything that's in our court up to the Court of Common Pleas court level and I'll tell you what, if the Federal Sup Supreme Court deemed it important enough, you can maintain an issue that would go all the way up there. So when it comes to issues such as um, landlord-tenant matters and housing issues, my jurisdiction is up to $12,000. Now, what's Judge Judy's jurisdiction? 5,000. Mine is higher than hers. How much money did she make last year? I'll tell you, $40 million. I told them I would do it for 400,000. So did you all get, a, get an opportunity, you all have a handbook. Okay, what I, what I need for you all to do is just peruse through your handbook because what I'm gonna do for the next hour, I'm gonna be here asking any questions that you may have um, um, when it comes to housing issues and when it comes to um, um, issues involving landlord and tenant matters. So let me just take a, a poll here. How many people here are either property managers or landlords? How many people here are tenants? Okay, so it's a, it's, it's a decent cross section. We have more tenants than we have property managers. Um, Maida, I think we got a, a nice crowd here today. So, so hopefully, sometime in the near future, we can convene a grant again and maybe even double the crowd that we have here today. So, anybody ever had a court experience? How was it? Okay, you say good? Oh, you must have won. <laughs> because sometimes court experiences are not that good. Um, I've been on the bench for 22 years. I am a lifelong resident of the Hill District community. I went to Fifth Avenue High School. My school is still in existence. Uh, I attended Carnegie Mellon University undergrad, where I got a, a degree in psychology and administration and management science. Then later on, I went on to attend Duquesne University School of Law. So, but how many of you know that in Pennsylvania, you don't have to be an attorney in order to be a magisterial district judge? There's probably a good reason for that. 
Um, this position emanated from the old justice of the peace. You ever heard that term? Yeah. It has just morphed into the animal that it is today. Justices of the peace back in the day handled community issues. Uh -huh. Issues involving your next door neighbor. And what they wanted to do was create a court where the community would feel comfortable by going in front of a judge, possibly maybe someone that they may even know. Because being a lifelong resident of the Hill District community, I have people in front of me all the time that I know. I still hear the case. I can remember the then president judge, uh, uh, President Dower, because one judge says, I can't hear that case because it involves my next door neighbor. And Judge Dower sent out a memo saying, why, did you re why do you think we created these courts? You're supposed to hear the case involving your next door neighbor because you know them and they know you. You are from the community, so you would be the person that more than likely can make the best decision involving your next door neighbors. My district covers all of the Hill District. That's a lot. My district covers all of downtown. Okay. That's a lot. And I go up in the Strip District up to 26th Street. Okay? I have rents in my court that go from zero all the way up to, what are they charging at your building? 5000 a month? Okay. Everybody gets treated the same. I have some folks who are in subsidized housing situations. Some rents are zero. Some rents are $25. You know what I always ask the property manager? What is the market rate for that unit? They tell me $900 or $1,000, and I tell that person whose rent is only zero, you're a $900 a month person. Don't act like you're a zero or a $25 a month person. I'm treating you like you're a $900 a month person simply because somebody is paying the difference. Yeah. And it's the Pennsylvania and the, and the government taxpayers that are paying the difference. So the landlord gets their $900 for that unit, even though the tenant's part may be only $25. So you stand tall. If you are in subsidized housing, you stand tall. You will be treated the same as someone that's paying $5,000 a month. So, what to know before going to court? Well, one good thing is to um, recognize that you're being sued. <laughs> okay, and that in order for you to be heard, you gotta show up. I can't tell you how many times, sometimes people just don't show up for court, and I don't understand that. You should be well, dressed appropriately, but appropriate is how you see it. I don't set dress standards for my court. I would expect people to kind of know that you should be clean and you should have uh, decent clothes on. That's right. But what if I got somebody that has a mental health issue? What if I have someone that doesn't smell good? Am I supposed to not hear that case? There are all kind of people that we deal with that come to courts. I take people as they are. You certainly can't come to court naked. <laughs> now, if you come to court naked, you're going to be bounced out of there. You know, and naked can mean, you know, very skimpy clothing and that kind of thing as well. You know, but certainly you, 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 you should have whatever, whatever you feel is clean and, and good, we'll, we'll, we'll approve that. Okay, I don't deal with that part. All right, you all take a look at that. Let's have the next slide. Okay, let's go back, please. What other rights do tenants have? Any questions with respect to that one? A right to attorney. Good question. No. In a criminal case, you do. In a, a famous case called Gideon versus Rain White, um, you have a right to an attorney. You know, why do we come to court anyway? Well, I'll tell you this, when, it, when there's something that involves a fundamental right, and there are several things that involve the right to vote, that's a fundamental right. If somebody commits a crime, you can't just put the person in jail and forget about them. They have to have due process of law. 
which is called notice in a hearing because you're getting ready to take their freedom. Freedom is a fundamental right. Well, it can be argued also that having a roof over your head is a fundamental right. That's why landlords can't come and just lock your doors and kick you out on the streets. You know, they have to provide you notice and a hearing and an opportunity to be heard. And if you don't like the decision, you can always take an appeal and go to the next court. And at some point, that ends. This is very interesting. A landlord cannot do the following to a tenant. Take or sell a tenant's property if they do not pay rent. Shut off utilities or lock a tenant out of the property if they do not pay rent. Harass a tenant. Enter the property or allow others to enter the property without giving notice. Require a deposit for an assistance animal. Cancel an existing lease of the tenants if the building is sold to a new landlord. Any questions about that one? Let's go over here. Uh, there's going to be a slide okay. that's going to cover that. Okay, we're going to go back to that. Yes. My thing is this: these new property developers, they tell me where I live. I won't disclose where I live. It's a very nice development. Um, we don't want to hear any complaints. Um, just enjoy a nice place to live. They don't want to fix certain things, or they allow people to violate their lease but they allow them to still live there. Okay, hold that question. There's gonna be a slide covering that. Next slide. Yes, sir. My question is based on barracks. It may be a different route. Answer this question. There are some properties now, owners and managers, that have now, there's no water meter, but they want you to pay a certain amount of water due to per person, per household. Can you be evicted if you don't pay that water bill? There's a slide covering that. <laughs> oh yeah, you know, we kind of like thought this stuff through, okay, before we put this handbook together. But I'm gonna go back to you. And if I don't, you make sure we cover that. Let's go to the next slide. Wow, you mean tenants have responsibilities? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Tenant must main a tenant's main responsibility is to pay the rent and to pay it on time. The number one complaint that I get when a landlord comes to see me is non-payment of rent. And I've heard all the reasons. You know, some of them are very good. You know, sometimes there was a death in the family and they took the rent money and they helped out with that and they got behind. You know, sometimes, I've had people be honest and say it was Christmas time and I wanted to get my kids something, something for Christmas. But you gotta weigh what's more important, having a roof over your head or, or paying some of these other bills. So paying rent, and there, are, there, and there are two kinds of breaches. A material breach is not paying your rent and drugs. That'll get you evicted. There are other breaches as well, other breaches that are just violations of the lease. And we can certainly talk about that. Somebody's playing their noise, their music too loud. I've even had issues with Marijuana smoking. You know, some people don't, don't like the smell of marijuana. Well, marijuana is now legal in 33 states. I think we're all going to have to get, be forced to, to, to start liking the smell of marijuana at some point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really. You know, if somebody has a marijuana car, what are you going to do? And you live right next door to them. I don't think they thought that part out. You know, it, would that be considered a nuisance? I hope I don't get a case like that. <laughs> really? Okay. They must also obey, obey the terms of the lease. They're going to talk about a lease in your handbook. The four corners of that agree, agreement. This is contract law. If your lease says I got to pay my rent on the first of the month, but you don't get your check until the 26th, and the landlord has always let you slide, or the property manager has let you slide until that time before they filed, and then some manager in another state that owns that building says, why do you have all these delinquencies? Start taking these people to court. Now that person that's used to paying their, their rent on the 26th now has to come up with it by the first of the month. Oh, that happens a lot, okay? So that contract says the first of the month, they can bring you to court.
Repair issues, pretty self-explanatory. The tenant should return the property the way it was when they moved in. Landlords, always take pictures. Take pictures when they move in and take pictures when they move out. Tenants, always take pictures. It's easy to take pictures now. If you got a flip phone, if you have a flip phone, you, you gotta leave. <laughs> they don't take good pictures. I had a friend of mine whose daughter was in my peach tree. I took a picture of her taking peaches. He said, who is that? I said, it's your daughter. I said, you need to get another phone. You know, we all armed with these tools. These tools come in very handy, okay? Return the, the property the way it was. Next slide. Landlord has responsibilities too. Main duty, maintain the property in good condition. I've seen a lot of violations when it comes to that. And it doesn't matter how nice your place is, okay? We know what good condition is. Safe, sanitary, and accessible as determined by housing codes. Repairs completed in a responsible time. Depends on the repair. You got a hole in your wall, you probably could live with that for, for a little while. But if your toilet ain't working, that needs to be fixed probably within 24 hours. You know, that's, that is an issue. Not required to pay for damage caused by the tenant. Oh, my son put that hole in the wall. Well, you're, you, you all gotta pay for that. Now the question is, is what's reasonable? As landlords, I'm not gonna give you a whole sheet of drywall to put up. They're gonna cut that hole out and patch it up and make it, make it, make it look good. Multi-unit building, landlord is responsible for maintaining common areas. To meet safety and cleanliness standards, a landlord must provide. Drinkable, drinkable water in the kitchen and bathroom, functioning bathroom with toilet and shower tub, safe and functioning electrical system, no chipped or peeling paint. Hot water, heat during cold months, working sewage system working, smoke alarms. Who's ever had their heat go out in the wintertime? Who's ever had their heat go out in the wintertime? That's a problem. That would probably be a violation of the warranty of habitability. And we'll talk about that. property managers in the hill that are slum landlords they are breaking all of that mm -hmm. so and the tenants want what's the best advice we've been working with the health department the everyone is it time for what do we need to do well the health department is the health department yeah. the problem is sometimes they don't respond quickly now the health department has somebody over them perhaps those folks need to be dealt with to get the health department to respond more quickly. And I'm not sure if whether or not it's a staffing issue or whatever it is, but you know, my experience with the health department has, has been pretty good. You know, I had a gentleman come down to my office a couple weeks ago. His landlord is from out of state. Okay, now this gentleman works for, he's on a, um, some kind of program with the university and he gets a stipend. And whenever he gets his stipend, he catches his rent up. Well, he didn't tell his landlord that when he rented the property. The landlord wants their rent every month. Now, he would pay all the late fees and all that stuff, so the landlord got tired. The landlord took his front door off, his property. Right in the building, took his front door off. And then cut, according to him, cut the water pipe. He called the police. That's what some things people do. I'm gonna tell you what's gonna happen when the police get there. They're gonna try to talk sense to you but the police cannot make that landlord put the door back on. There's no crime committed. You know, remember, the police are part of the executive branch of government. You know, that is not a crime. That is a civil matter. When they went down in the basement of the building to find out about the pipe, they found the door. So he put the door up as best as he can, but not before his flat screen TV was gone. So they're running down my place. Now you all know that we were downtown for 20 years. 
we're back in the community now. You can roll right out of bed into my court. <laughs> you can drag your shop and save bags and come over to my court. Ask my staff, it happens all the time. You know, fielding questions. That's what that young man did. And the police officer was over my office three times. Now see, this is the stuff that they don't see. This is not the court stuff, but this is the, all the stuff that we, that we deal with. I got the health department on the phone in that situation, and the health department will determine if whether or not that is an emergency situation. Now he had a baby in the house, so they were able to contact that landlord. Now the landlord had a representative here in Pittsburgh that was unavailable. So what he ended up doing was he sued the landlord. In my court, I made the landlord come in from New York. Yeah, you're going to get on a plane or drive. This, if, if this is what you got to do. You want to own property in Pennsylvania, then you need to manage it well. He had to come in from New York. I had them both sitting there. Okay? I had this hearing, and I gave them both directives. That, that, now remember, this guy had been to my window three or four times. The police had been over. We finally get them in the court. Now I got to continue the case one more time for him to make the corrections, put that door on right, make sure that, that water pipe is, is, is working properly, and then we're going to come back and, and let's see if you did all this. Now meanwhile, he's not getting his rent either because of this situation with the University of Pittsburgh. Then I had to schedule a case when he was available to come back from New York on a day that I don't have landlord-tenant hearings. But I made myself available because of the urgency of this situation. And he got his door back on, he got his water fixed. Now the landlord is filing the order for possession to put him out. But the place was inhabitable. The place was not fit to live in, particularly for a baby. So, yes. We can't talk about D Rod Street right now. Yo, please. D.Y. Street, we, we would never get out of here. That would just be one question. But you know what? They are people too. Okay, they are people too. Next slide. Landlord's responsibilities continued. Landlord must inform a tenant of lead-based paint pipes. Some old buildings have lead-based paint. Okay. I mean, I get all these issues. You know, I, I had an issue where, where a lady wasn't paying her rent but she had one of those clawfoot tubs that it was painted with lead-based paint and she complained about it. I think it was a housing authority situation. And so the guy had to come and re-strip the tub and, 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 and put, the, put the, the right paint on there, but she wouldn't let him in the house to do it. Okay? And then so therefore the housing authority start, stopped paying the rent. Now imagine that mess that I had to deal with. You know, to see there are some clever tenants around here too that, that, that don't do the right thing, okay? So, if the tenant pays the utilities, separate utilities from the rent, the landlord must install separate meters. If they cannot be metered separately, the landlord must pay the utility bill and add it to the rent. Skip, kind of like going with what you talked about. We'll come, we'll come back to that, okay? If a tenant tells the landlord that the smoke alarm is broken, the landlord has 72 hours to replace it. Okay, somebody must have researched that 72 hour thing because I didn't know it was 72 hours. Now let's talk about the law just real quickly. If this, home, if this whole room is the law, let's suppose this whole room was a brick. These are all bricks and it was all the law. I'm an expert in one brick. And I'm a judge. The law is just too vast. The law covers everything. That chair you're sitting on, the air we breathe, um, this floor, making sure there's no formaldehyde in it. You know, so, but I'm an expert in one brick. I know how to get to the rest of the stuff. There are other folks that are experts in it, so, so the law is so vast. Now, 72 hours, that sounds reasonable to me. I thought it might be quicker. But they have 72 hours to replace it. It is quicker. It's quicker? Okay, all right. Let's talk about the lease. A lease is an agreement between a landlord and tenant that a tenant can occupy and use a property for a certain amount of time in exchange for rent. Be sure to fully understand and agree with his terms before signing. Leases can be an oral written. An oral lease must have 
less than a three-year term. If it is more than the lease must be in writing. The lease must be written in plain language. That's important, no fine print. Um, how many of you have ever read your entire lease? From what I can remember, the Housing Authority has a very lengthy lease. Other people, some leases are 23, 24 pages. And they have you initial certain things on the lease before you sign it. So just in case you say you didn't know, that's going to come back and bite you. The four corners of that agreement tells what you agreed to. Okay, now, an oral lease is much more difficult to enforce than a written lease. Because in an oral lease situation, if the landlord says, well, this is what I told them, and the tenant says, no, you didn't, then it doesn't come in. But if it's written down there, then that is going to be a viable tool to use in court. Next one. What can a lease contain? The lease term. What dates is the, the tenant allowed to live there? OK. Repairs. Who, the dates are very important. You know, some leases start on the first, some leases don't. You know, most leases are for one year, and after the one year, they go into a month, a month tenancy. Some leases automatically renew after 60 days. So that means if you go 61 days, you messed up. They're counting those days. If that lease says it automatically renews for another one year term for 60 days, but you have to notify them and you let one day go by, you know, that landlord can, can hold you accountable for, 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 for a whole other year. So you better be looking at your lease uh, very carefully. Smoke alarms, okay, who is responsible to check the smoke alarms? Visitors, can other people stay for an extended amount of time? Huge problem. You know, Cousin Johnny comes in and stays the whole summer, but is not on the lease. Cousin Johnny is causing problems. Can Cousin Johnny stay there? Are you supposed to check with the landlord? I'm sure that there's, there's some rule that, that may say a, a couple of weeks is fine, you know, but a certain number of weeks, maybe three weeks, then, then you're going to have to let us know how long this person is going to be there. You may be keeping your grandchild for the whole summer, you know, anything. Make sure when you do something like that, you're covered in the lease. Visitors, can other people stay for an extended amount of time? We talked about that entering. Must the landlord provide the tenant notice before any the property? Absolutely, unless there's an emergency. The landlord's driving by their property and they see water running under the door, they don't have to let you know. They're gonna go in there and stop the water. That's an emergency. But if they wanna come in and check on the condition of their property, make, making sure that you are a good housekeeper, they should give you 48 hours notice. And Landlords should also cover themselves even more. They should leave you a note letting you know when they got there and leave a note letting you know when they left. That covers them and it also lets you know and puts you on notice that they were there. Utilities, who pays for which utilities? You know, some leases say I pay the water, you pay the light and gas. Some leases say I pay everything. Some leases say you pay everything. Okay, that should be checked off in the lease. Late charges, are there any late charges? You know, I've seen late charges that are ridiculously high, up to $400. Now to me, that's unconscionable. And I will tell them that's unconscionable. I'm not giving you a $400 late fee. They are also, some leases are allowed to attorney fees. I've seen some attorney fees that were unconscionable, $1,500. I've awarded $400, I've awarded $500, you know, depending on the situation and depending on what they had to do. You know, so I've seen some reasonable late fees. The lowest late fee I see is $10. Um, there's an entity in, in here in, in the Hill District that only charges $10. I think a housing authority may charge $15. That's pretty low. You know, $50 is, is pretty reasonable. $75 is not too bad. You're not supposed to be late. Waiver of notice to quit. Let's talk about that notice to quit. Before a landlord brings you to court, they have to post your door. <coughs> notice to quit. Certified mail is insufficient. You can't send a notice to quit in the mail. You gotta go post the door. Now, the rules don't require proof, but if I was a landlord and I'm providing a notice to quit, I'm getting some kind of evidence that I put the notice to quit there. Just bring the notice to quit the court. Let me see what you posted. 
You got a cell phone, take a picture of it on the door with the apartment number. That's even more. The rules don't say that you have to have it, but, but you got to provide the notice to quit before you come to court. 10 day notice, drugs or, or back rent. 15 days, breach of a lease condition. If you're not renewing the lease and you know you're not renewing the lease, 30 days, you're always safe. But that has to be posted on the door or handed to the person in person. In some leases, there's a waiver of notice to quit. Um, can you waive a notice to quit? If it's in the lease, I'm going to honor it. But there may be a legal argument with respect to that. I have not heard a good legal argument that says that you should have to post because the, because the waiver of notice to quit was in the, in the lease. More than likely, it gets honored. But if you come to my court, you know, we call that a procedural matter. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that you did that first before you even file. That's a fatal flaw if you don't provide the notice. Your, your case can be dismissed and you will have to start the process all over again. So it's good to have some kind of proof that you did it. Next. Resolving issues outside of the court. When any problem arises, the tenant should send a written notice to the landlord. If the landlord does not respond or does nothing, the tenant should send a second notice. That's pretty important. Oftentimes when I find tenants coming to court, it's always verbal. Nobody has something in writing that I told you to fix this. Tenants, if you have a problem with your unit and you're notifying the landlord, you know, keep yourself a ledger as to when you notify that person, put it in writing. So if you ever have to come to court, the landlord cannot say that I didn't know. Have some proof of that. Security deposit, a landlord has 30 days to return it. If any money is deducted, the landlord must itemize deductions or the tenant can sue for twice the amount. That's true. If you, how many of you have ever paid a security deposit? Okay, well, when you leave, you gotta provide notice to the landlord as to where you're gonna be leave, moving to. That's part of the process. They need to know where to send the security deposit to. I would also advise any tenant that if you're ever moving, do a walkthrough with the landlord and take pictures. A lot of people don't do a walkthrough with their landlord. And next thing you know, the landlord sends them an itemized bill as to how they spent their security deposit. So your security deposit was $600, but you only got 100 back. Now you're mad, okay? But if you had an opportunity to walk through with the landlord, you could say, no, that was like that when I got here. Here are the pictures, or something like that. And, but they have to send you an itemized statement as to how they spent your security deposit. And if they default in doing that, you can sue them in a court such as mine for double the amount. Repairs, take pictures of damages. Call 311 to file a complaint with the Department of Licenses, Permits, and Inspections. That's the 311 line for the city, the building code people. A health and housing issue code inspector will be sent. Um, I don't know about that part, but you know that's more, more of a health department issue um, that deals with, with, with health, health issues. Repair and deduct tenants make repairs and deducts costs from future rent, cannot exceed the monthly rent amount, keep receipts and estimates and inform the land of this action. Um, I can't tell you what to do in a situation like that. But if that's an action that you take and it has to come to court, make sure that you uh, have records of what it is that you repaired, but most, and most, mostly make sure that you've given the landlord a reasonable opportunity to take care of it before you did. Because the landlord may have their own person to do the repairs. Now if it took forever and you had to go get somebody, but you have to, when you, and you come to court, make sure that you have something that says, you know, I contacted my landlord on this particular day and he never responded. And I contacted him again and this was such an urgent situation that I had to go get it done myself. That's reasonable. Okay, what is an eviction? A landlord can decide to evict a tenant for three reasons. The term of the lease has ended, the tenant has violated conditions in the lease, the tenant has failed to pay rent. All right, that's important. You sign a year lease and now your year is up. You're the best tenant in the world. Matter of fact, let's suppose you were there for 10 years. You're the best tenant in the world and the landlord says that they now want their place back. They have a right to take their place back. 
You can't make somebody rent to you, okay? But they have to give you proper notice before that happens. Oftentimes, the amount of notice is spelled out in the lease, or if they give you a 30-day written notice saying that I'm not renewing your lease, that's putting you on notice that you have to find somewhere else to go. Now, that 30-day notice is very important. You have to be timely as to when you do it. If your rent's due on the first of the month, more than likely it should give you that 30-day notice the day before. Say the 30th of the month or the 29th of the month. Because if they wait until the first or second, you get that month plus the following month. You follow me? If you're already into your rent term, your, 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 your rent is due on the first of the month, and they messed around and they didn't give you their, your 30 day notice until the second, then you get that month plus the next month. Now, if they give you your 30 day notice the day before the first, then they're good. You know, after that month, they can come and file in our court. Okay, eviction. Eviction means they can just put you, they can put you out. But they can't come and just lock your doors. Reasons for eviction, non-payment of rent, drugs, that'll get you kicked out in a heartbeat. The notice period for non-payment of rent is only 10 days. Now, there were some lobbyists, I'm sure, many, many years ago, because it used to take a long time to get somebody out of your place. Now the time period is much, much shorter. And I'm sure there, there is a landlord and tenant lobby that lobbied for this 10-day notice. And they probably would like to have a shorter day if they could. Shorter time period. The waiver of the notice to quit, we talked about that. All right, when a landlord files in our court, you're gonna receive a notice on your door and you're gonna get one in the mail, okay? If you're ever being sued, I would show up. Remember this, we're in this internet age. Everybody can see this when you're sued. So if you show up in order to present your case, you have a better chance of winning. Because when you go move to the next place, they're gonna look to see if you've ever been evicted from somewhere. And you don't have to be a, a, a big apartment complex to have access to that information. That information is readily available. You all can look it up, okay? So you don't wanna come to court. You don't wanna put yourself in a situation where somebody says, I can't take a chance on you because you've been sued before. You've been evicted before. That way is heavy. Let's suppose you may want to sue the landlord as well. Well, if the landlord files a landlord and tenant complaint against you, you can file a counterclaim. The landlord has already paid the court costs. So for a nominal fee, you can file your own counterclaim and the judge will hear both of those claims together. And one does not necessarily have to relate to the other, but it has to be against that individual. Okay. In order to file a counterclaim, you have up to five days to do that before um, the hearing. You gotta give your landlord an opportunity to prepare a defense for whatever it is that you are alleging. It wouldn't be fair to file a counterclaim the day before the hearing. So the rules say you have to do it at least five days before the hearing. That gives the, the, the landlord an opportunity to hire, to, to bring their, their, their in-house counsel, bring their own lawyer, or, or to prepare a defense. Self-help evictions. When a landlord uses illegal means to evict a tenant, you can't come and lock, just lock somebody's doors and not come to court. That'll get you in big trouble if you're a landlord. Turning off utilities. That would make the place uninhabitable. Remember I told you about the guy whose water pipe was cut. Changing locks, removing a tenant's belongings, et cetera. You can't do none of that. I remember a landlord says, well, I think they've abandoned the unit. I said, well, is there stuff in there? I said, yeah. They said, yeah. I said, they're, they're still in there. He said, well, what's, I said, is there a toothbrush in there? <laughs> then they're still in there, okay? So if they come back and you've already changed the locks, you better give them a key and you better do it right, post the door, and come to court. All right, we've talked about landlord and tenant actions. What about a civil case that doesn't involve a landlord and tenant? Well, landlord and tenant does fall under civil actions, but 
between the civil suit between two litigants, the plaintiff and defendant, determines whether the defendant is liable for injury or harm done to a plaintiff. Plaintiff must have a preponderance of the evidence. What they mean by that is how many of you ever, ever heard of beyond a reasonable doubt? That's a high standard to prove in a criminal case. In a civil case, beyond a preponderance of the evidence, evidence means that all we have to do is tip the scales, 51%. Hit like that. That's it. Civil case is a lower standard. Beyond a reasonable doubt is way up here. When I'm in criminal court and I do criminal cases, prima facie is down here. Beyond a preponderance of the evidence is just 51%. How cases get to court? Landlord or tenant perceives a violation of the lease agreement or landlord and tenant law. Landlord or tenant files a complaint with the district court where the property is located. There are fees involved with filing a case. Yes, there are. The court has interviewers to assist in completing the necessary forms, but this is not legal advice. We don't have that. Okay, there's nobody in my court that's going to prepare, help you prepare. I, I, I told my staff they can't do any of that. We cannot, district judges have to be the neutral and detached body. We're not on the landlord's side, we're not on the tenant's side, even though I'm from this community. I'm the neutral and detached person. We're not gonna help you prepare your complaint and then hear the case. That just doesn't make sense. So you have to, you have to prepare your own complaints. We may ask, answer general questions and that sort of thing. Plaintiff must then serve the complaint on the defendant. If a plaintiff, plaintiff does not serve the defendant or service is defective, then the case will be dismissed. Okay, now they're talking about a regular civil case. In landlord-tenant cases, you don't have to have service. All you have to do is post the door. In a civil case, you have to get somebody to sign off on the certified mail, and there's no longer a green card that comes anymore. It's all computerized. We go to our computer, there's a computerized signature there or you have to serve the person directly or an adult at the house. That is considered service. Without service, you cannot proceed in a regular civil case. So for instance, your landlord is suing you for rent, but you have a civil case because your ceiling fell and water damaged all of your property. You're not filing a counter claim to a land, or, or, or you're filing a civil case. You're not filing a landlord tenant case. So I'm gonna hit a landlord's um, civil uh, landlord and tenant case, but I'm going to hear your civil case at the same time. Now, in your civil case, the landlord certainly has to be served. Okay, the court will set a hearing date. If one party does not show up, the court may enter judgment against the absent party. So I'm telling you, it's always important to be there. Defendants can file a continuance to move the trial date back, and the court may grant such continuances if justice so requires. These motions must be made in writing and filed at least 10 days before the hearing date. Okay, well, I mean, that makes sense. If you get a court date and you cannot show up, then you have to notify the court because we have to notify the other side, and we need time to do that. Sometimes you can't get within that 10-day window, and we try to be, do what's reasonable. I, as a judge, have actually called the other side and say the, the other side can't be here. Um, and sometimes they're happy. They didn't want to come on that day anyway. So, you know, and then sometimes they say no, but I have to determine if whether or not it's a reasonable request. Is this the first continuance? Okay, so more than likely continuances often will be granted. They will not be extended long when you're talking about a landlord-tenant case because once a landlord-tenant case is filed, we have seven, ten, seven to 10 days to get it on the docket, whereas a civil case can take, take a little longer. Okay, landlords, the written lease. I can look at, a land, look at a case and see how much paperwork they're carrying, and that'll tell me how well prepared a landlord is. I have landlords that come to my court with the entire file. <coughs> Actually, I like to see that. Because whatever paperwork the tenant says that they didn't, they didn't get, they can open up that file and say, yes, you did. I see landlords come to, come to court with nothing. I say this is gonna be a pretty interesting case if the tenant is contesting anything. But how am I supposed to know that a contract exists if you didn't bring the lease? How am I supposed to know if there is a lease violation if you didn't bring the lease with you? Okay, if you are a large housing complex and you file 30 cases, then you better bring 30 leases. 
you might have to bring them in with a wagon and pull them in. But you should have the lease in court. So I can know that there is, there is a contract, it is signed by both parties, and I can see what the terms of the agreement is. Current business privilege license, um, not sure about that. Housing inspection license, if operating a multi-unit building, those issues have never come up. A copy of the notice to quit unless the lease waives the notice, good idea. Most of the times, landlords do have a copy of the notice to quit. Now, I had one landlord that looks like he just recycles the same old one all the time because I could, I could look at it and tell. I said, really, did you post a door with that? And that looks like the same one you brought to court last time. The issue can't be the same for every tenant. You all framed your notices to quit based on what's going on, you know, whatever the violation is. I do like to see, if you've been in front of me, you know I want to see that, that waiver of notice before we proceed. Unpaid utility bills if the lease requires the tenant to pay them. It's good. Now, now that's interesting right there. I've had landlords ask for water bills because the tenant's supposed to pay the water bill. And I'll ask the landlord, well, did you pay the water bill? And they'll say no, but it's in the lease. I'll say, well, then, if you didn't pay the water bill and I award you the water bill, What's to say that you're going to go pay the water bill? Now, if you paid it and you expensed it and you have proof that you did it, that's a whole lot different than asking for the water bill just because it's in the lease. Okay? Did you notify the tenant of the water bill? That's another thing. You know, these water bills sometimes don't make it to the tenant. They may hold the water bill for two, three, four months. Next thing you know, the water is getting cut off, and now you want the tenant to come up with $2,000. You know, those are issues that I have to deal with. So as a landlord, make sure if, the, if they pay the water bill that the tenant gets a copy of that water bill each and every month. And maybe you can create some sort of document to show that you gave it to them. Not paying the water bill? If it's in the lease? They can bring you to court. Now, if whether or not you'll get evicted, mm, I try not to evict, have people evicted but I try to get them to the point where they can pay that water bill. Okay, it may, you, you may get a judgment against you if they've paid it. And yes, you can get evicted if you don't pay the judgment. Okay, because that'll all go into the rent. If it's part of the lease, that'll all go into, that's just like not paying your rent. That's once you have your day in court. Exactly. But remember, they can't do anything until they bring you to court. And if you don't like the decision, you have 10 days to appeal the possession. That means the part where they can put you out, you have 30 days to appeal the money. Photographs of alleged damages, always a good thing. Proof of payment, invoices and estimates, we just talked about that. Communi communication between parties about any damages. You know, sometimes tenants will let damages just go. I've seen situations where the tenant is not responsible for the water bill and they know the turtle's running all day. And they don't say nothing to nobody. That's crazy. It's on the landlord. Do you know how much your water bill is going to be if your toilet is running all day? Or if you go somewhere and you're gone for a week or 10 days and your toilet's running? I've seen situations like that where the tenant is responsible for the water bill and the toilet's running all day. And don't nobody say nothing. Why I called them, he didn't do anything. And you're paying that water bill. I had a water bill just recently that was $2,300 and something dollars. And the landlord wanted to get paid for that. And I asked the landlord, I said, well, did you pay it? And he says, no. I says, well, you know, she gives you $2,300. You can go spend it on something else and the toilet still be running. You know how much it costs to stop a toilet from running? Probably about 10 bucks. Well, if they, if, they, if, if, if they are a property manager, that means they, owe, they work for the people that own the... They don't have to be licensed to be a property manager. You, 
That's a legal argument. I got that argument. Okay, if you want to present the argument, I'm going to listen to the argument. But you have to have all your I's dotted and your T's crossed. I can't comment on that. I've never seen that issue before. Okay, but I do know that you can authorize just about anybody to represent you in court. Now, the Rule 207B says that you have to have first-hand knowledge of what's going on. So you don't even have to be a property manager. It could be your brother. You could be your sister, you know, or somebody. It could be your elderly mother owns the property, but you're the person that comes to court. You're the person that collects the rent. She told me um, my specialty is leasing and escrow, but I have pending getting my real estate license. Okay, I hope she gets it. Okay. Okay. Hold your questions on your violations because I haven't seen a legal issue yet. I, I've seen conversation, but I haven't seen a legal issue yet. <coughs> what a tenant must bring to file a case. To sue for security deposit, the written lease, documentation that the keys were returned and forwarded address was provided. Let's talk about that. I've seen people just up and leave and don't even tell the landlord they're gone. They're still getting charged rent yep. because they still got the key. I left it in the mailbox. You know, if you are a landlord, what better information tells you that a person is gone other than then giving you your key back? That's a big and a huge sign telling you that we are gone. To just up and leave and not turning your key and not telling anybody, and they'll wonder why, now they, they, because they can't rent that unit out, because they think that you are still there, okay? So turning in your key is very important, and landlords, you know, create a document that says they turned the key in, and let them sign it. You know, give everybody, give everybody a copy, it's very easy to do. Documentation that the key was returned and a forwarding address was provided. And we talked about that doubling of the security deposit if you sue them. Well, if you didn't provide them with your forwarding address, you don't get that. So because you didn't follow the rules. Now, sometimes people don't want, to, want the landlord to know where they moved to. Okay, that's a problem. But you're supposed to provide them with a forwarding address. And we talked about also doing a walkthrough. You know, don't just let the landlord send you a check of what's left in your security deposit. Walk through the unit. Sometimes they may have so many units they may not remember that that damage was there. You point it out to them. You take pictures. You got before and after pictures. Cover yourself. Entering the courtroom. My courtroom is right here. I uh, gave the Hill House a 10 year lease. Now they want to sell the building. That's a whole separate argument. <laughs> But whoever gets it has to honor my lease. I got six and a half years left, okay? So, but we're back in the community. And I wrestled with that issue. I liked the downtown flavor for a minute. You know, but it was more of a hardship on, on, on the people to have to come down there. You know, so we tried to pick a location that was good for the folks downtown and good for the folks in the Hill District. But when they sold our building, we got an opportunity to come back to the community. After 50 years, we are back. So I think that's a good thing because these are community courts, okay? And people need to be able to drive down Center Avenue and, 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 and see that sign in the window. Now I could have got this big humongous sign, but my, my ego ain't that big, you know? <laughs> I have seen some big signs for these courts. Drive down Lawrenceville, look at that sign down there. Yeah. Yes, sir. I want to go yeah. back to the security department. Yes, ma'am. I moved from one apartment building into another. Previous landlord. You, you move from one building to another. One building to another. Mm -hmm. Let the previous landlord, I gave her my information from my old address to my new. Mm -hmm. Just one stroke of the pen made the check to my security deposit go to the wrong address. It was cashed. The check was cashed. So now we got to call the police now. She, well, she, they followed up and they found out where the check had been cashed, and they sent me another check within about 30 days. You know, that, but they sued the person 
and the store that cashed the check. Well, those people were lucky because they could have been arrested. Now that's a criminal, that's a criminal charge right there. But the great part about your story is that you got your money, right? Because I was, I was afraid that I was going to have to answer a serious question. You got your money, so you're good. Okay. So sign in your attendance to be, okay, all that's, my staff handles that part. I don't deal with none of that. I don't want to talk to nobody. You know, one person heard me say that I don't talk to, that I, that I, I live three blocks from my job and I drive to work. And I remember being at the gym, somebody, they heard, somebody heard me say, um, well, don't send me nobody, don't send me nothing involving him on Facebook with a, with a, with a, with a link to him because he don't talk to people. Well, they didn't get the whole story. I am not going to walk from my house to my job and encounter all these people before I get there, maybe causing me to be late, and I do not want a litigant to see me in conversation with the opposing party prior to the hearing. So in order for me to move up here, I told them these things have to happen. I have to be able to come in through that side door, I have to have off street parking because I don't want to see anybody, I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want people to have access to me. And when, you, when you're from this community like I am, I've been here all my life, people are going to know you. How am I supposed to know that you're plowing me up and you got a hearing that's coming up in five minutes? <laughs> you know, you're going to hug on me and do everything you can, you know? And if you're a litigant, what does that look like? So it's not that I would be improper, because I don't think my brother would want to come in front of me if he didn't have his eyes dotted and his T's crossed. That's just the way I roll, you know? But what does it look like to the other people? It's the appearance of impropriety. You know, that's why I got to watch where I go, what I do. And somebody's watching me today. My wife is sitting back there. <laughs> we had a question. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. What about uh, when you have a tenant that does not have, a, have the money to file for a complaint? And the other one, what about multiple tenants on a lease? Okay, if a tenant doesn't have the money to file a complaint, there is an informal papyrus form that you can fill out in my office. Um, we'll set up a, uh, a little impromptu hearing where I will interview you to make sure that you don't have the money. But I'm gonna tell you this, I've seen people pull up in some nice cars trying to file an informal papyrus complaint. <laughs> that ain't gonna fly with me. You know, I've seen people G'd up trying to file an informal papyrus complaint. Okay, you have to have some kind of evidence that you're poor. The courts have created an opportunity for a poor person to come to court if they can show that they cannot afford it. Matter of fact, even if you are filing an appeal. Now, I make 8,000 8, decisions a year. As a matter of fact, I make so many decisions that I'm decisioned out by the time I get home. And my wife wonders why the dishes aren't done. And I tell her I'm decompressing, you know. So, but to answer your question, the courts have figured out a way for, for folks who cannot afford it to still file their case. It'll just be zero in the court cost section. And oftentimes it could be somebody who may be getting DPA, it could be somebody who is on social security, disability, not the other one, where you're getting 1200 a month, okay. It's the, it's, the, it's the lower one. It could be somebody who has no, in, no, no rent. And if you file an appeal, they will, they will create a way for you to hear your case as well. Because once you file an appeal, you have to come up with three months back rent or the judgment amount, whichever is less. So if your rent's 600 a month, you gotta come up with $1,800. Or the judgment amount. You may have a $1,000 judgment. Well, if you can't afford it, they will put you on a payment plan down there in arbitration, okay? Now, if they put you on a payment plan, they're gonna give you a date by which you're supposed to come up with your payment, okay? Let's suppose you gotta come up with $200 by the fifth of the month. I'm telling you, these landlords are sharp. They're gonna be calling down there on the fifth at 4.30, 25 to see if you made that payment. And they will be there on the sixth that if you didn't make the payment to get your appeal terminated. And they will bring that document back to my office to say, the supersedus has been terminated, we can proceed. Now, if you actually get an appeal and it's heard by the appellate court, you can't come back to my court. 
after that. You have to do all the eviction stuff in the court that made the decision. But if there is no decision on the merits, you, it can come back to me. So yes, and what was the other part of your question? What about uh, dual or multi-tenants? How does a tenant protect herself from the other tenants? They're all paying part of the rent. How do they protect themselves? Okay, how's the lease structure? Does the lease, is, are they separate leases? Or are they all the same lease? If they're all in the same lease, they're all liable for whatever the other one does. Yep. So if the other two, or one or two move out, who is responsible for Well, it depends on how they moved out. Did they break the lease? The one did. Okay, then, then whoever else is there is liable. If the rent is $1,000 a month, they don't care who they get it from. Whether it's one or all five. You got two, five people paying 200 a month, or one patient person playing with 1,000. But the other tenants have recourse against the person that left. And that would be a civil case. But the question is, is how do you find them? You still have to go through the civil process of suing them and having service and all that kind of stuff. And now, let me tell you this, you know, once you get a judgment against you, you know, some people are judgment proof. They'll never get anything on credit. And other people aren't. I remember my secretary told a story about her neighbor hit her car. 300 something dollars worth of damage and never paid her. She's watching him come and go every day. She filed a case against him, he didn't show up. She got a default judgment. Three years went by and he went to buy a house. Hmm. What about this judgment? Now he's looking for her. She got her $300. Okay, so you get a judgment, it pays to follow up on that judgment. Okay, it pays to, to, to go down to Pathonetary's office. I think they, you can renew them every five years or something like that. But those five tenants, everybody's responsible for the rent, unless you get five separate leases. Who has power? Judges, rulings are, bi rulings are binding, but may be appealed. That's a good thing. Somebody comes up to me and didn't like the way I ruled. And I always say this, the good Lord himself can be decided in these cases, and everybody's not gonna agree with him. Okay, some people come to court prepared, some people come to court expecting to win, but they're not prepared. Now, if they, after they leave my court and it gets appealed, they do better, because they know uh, where, they, where they failed in my court. So, we're hoping that by doing these, what we're doing today, that everybody's prepared. Okay, and that we can, that when people come to court, they are not intimidated, they are not afraid, they know about the process. We are here and we are available to everybody, no matter what the issue is. As long as you have an issue that is um, what we call a cause of action. Okay, if you're suing somebody for whatever reason, you know, there, there, there are rules with respect to that reason. It could be breach of contract, which is what a lease is. It's a breach of con contract issue. It could be a tort claim. Somebody runs into your car, okay? So there are issues with respect to that. It could, it could be um, negligence. You, you, you slip and fall because somebody didn't salt their walkway or something like that. You know, so, you know, all those issues, negligence, you know, has its rules and you have to come to court prepared for that. Courtroom procedure, I can't read that. I don't care about all that. Okay, listen you all, the great thing is that you all got this handbook. And I wanna thank Pennsylvania for modern courts, for their efforts, made them, and Tom, you all raise your hands again, they're up there. Let's give them a round of applause. <clears throat> I can tell you this, they are impressed because they've gone to other communities and have not gotten this many people. And the, and the word got out, but I didn't put it on my Facebook page because I didn't want people responding to me asking me a whole bunch of legal questions on Facebook. I mean, I'm just telling you. You know, I've, I've had people FaceTime, or, or, um, what is that, Messenger. I've gotten phone calls on my phone from Messenger and I'm like, what? And I've had people, at, you know, you got to inconvenience yourself. You cannot be sitting in the comfort of your home in order to get me to deal with a legal issue. If you come down my office, you have inconvenienced yourself. If you call me, you have inconvenienced yourself. But you're not going to be sitting at home on your cell phone and think that you're going to message me on Messenger and I'm going to answer. It ain't happening. 
That is not going to happen. So let's let's let's. How about some questions? Anybody anybody got any questions? Yes. Yes, you can. You, you would ask me that question. Yes. Um, you're supposed to. She, 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 her, the question was is if you have a security deposit and it's time you're leaving the place and it's time to get your security deposit back, can you get that plus interest? Um, security deposits are supposed to be placed in an interest bearing account. Okay, now, your security deposit, let's suppose it's just $600. How much interest do you think you're going to collect on $600? How much period of time? A year. Let's say a year. It's probably just a couple of dollars. Two, three dollars. I mean, look at your interest statements. You know, I mean, two, three dollars. But the answer to your question is yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, any other questions? Thank you. If you have someone that has an automatic renewal in the lease, but the landlord has sent out a renewal form to get signed, and it says that there are no changes, but it's still a form that needs to be signed, does that then supersede the automatic renewal? No. No, you, you got a lease? My interpretation of that now, remember, out of 500 and something judges across the state of Pennsylvania, um, everybody has their, their way of interpreting the law. But if I got a lease that says the lease renews automatically in 60 days and then you follow it up with another document that supports that or is, or is the language different? It's the same. I'm going with the lease. Okay. I'm going with what's in the lease. I'm required to pay all my utilities, but the landlord never changed the water bill in my name since I lived there, which has been two years. So every year I have to, I mean, every month I have to call and get an amount of what it is. So I figured, I'm trying to figure out why the bill has never been switched in my name. The landlord always said it was the water company because the form, they never um, went through with the form and the water company saying that it's the landlord that needs to send in this form. So I figured, I called, and there was a balance on my water bill before I moved in that the landlord never paid. So I wanna know if I leave that balance on the water bill when I move out, does my landlord, or can he hold my security deposit from me? All right, water bills are shaky questions. Now, let's talk about electric bills and gas bills. Tenants can get those in their names. Water bills run with the land. Here's what I mean by that. You got a mole on your face, that's your water bill. That mole goes wherever you go, okay? Water bills run with the land. They are not gonna put a water bill in your name. My parents had a property from 1997. My mom died and my dad died. I let the property just sit because I just liked going over there to the house, looking at the furniture, looking at the pictures. Then finally, you got to get through it. So I decided to rent the place out. Um, I had to open up the estate because my dad never put me on a deed. That's a whole other conversation, <laughs> but y'all know about that. My dad never put me on the deed, so I had to open up the estate in order to get the house in me and my wife's name. I got it for a dollar for love and affection. They had a mortgage on the property. I had to pay that, okay? I tried to buy a city lot next door to my old house. And I jumped through all these hoops for the city for nine months and they told me that I had this um, outstanding water bill from 1997. That was my parents' water bill, it wasn't mine. Guess what? I had to pay it. That's it. That's it. Water bills run with the land. 
okay, you can get a copy of the water bill. You got to contact the water, get them on the phone. I went through a similar, with the same house, I went through a similar problem. I just get the water bill. I take a picture of it and I send it to my tenants every, every month. Well, that's what I would expect, but all my money is not sent to the bill, so I would have to call the water company every month to get an estimate of what, what my amount is. And I mean, it goes deeper because I got 48 hours shut off notice and all that yeah. stuff. Now, that's an issue between you, the water company, and your landlord, okay, in that you better cover yourself in a situation like that so you, just in case that they try to, to come in after you for that, that you can, you can deal with that issue. But I do think that the landlord has to be um, um, cooperative when it comes to getting a water, the water bill in your name. The landlord has to sign off on that document as well. And maybe the landlord has not done that. Uh, he says that he's done it, he sent it over to the water company. The water company is saying that it's on the list, like it's a back and forth thing. Yes. And because it's in my lease that I pay the water, the water is the water is Based on my experience with the water company, now keep in mind, remember that water bill I paid from 1997? The company that processed that bill went out of business. Okay? I paid that bill in 2010. When I tried to buy a city property next door, that bill came up. And they said, you, have a, you, you didn't pay this water bill. I said, yes, I did. I said, I did the estate. I listed them as a creditor on the estate, but I didn't have the original receipt because the company went out of business. I spent three hours looking for a check or some kind of credit card statement. I had to pay it again. It was, it was, it was 700 and something dollars, but the second time I had to pay 300 and something. That was dealing with the water company. Now, my situation was this. It wasn't worth my time fighting with them because they had already given me a headache. And sometimes they just beat you down so bad that you just go ahead and you just pay them because it's too much bureaucracy to deal with them. You're dealing with the water authority. You know, I, I, I think that you can prevail, but just make sure that you're able to prove that there was a balance on that water bill before, before you moved in. Any other questions? What time is it? Did we make our six to eight? Is it eight o'clock yet? It's a quarter. It's a quarter to eight, Judge. And we have a couple of other things to take care of before everyone runs out the door. So first, I want to thank you so much for being here today. And now, I know you're not going to be happy about this, but my hope is that you will do a post questionnaire now. That helps us tremendously because we'll see whether this was really helpful to you or not, if there's information that we didn't cover well enough. So if you don't mind, if you just take, you know, three or four minutes and fill out another questionnaire just to let us know whether this was really effective. And um, when, when you're finished doing that, we have some additional information for you about uh, legal aid services and other information, other organizations that you can contact. Tom, if you want to, if you want to come up and join me. And I think we're, Jamela, if you could move the move to the next slide, so we have 
and the next one because everyone had a chance to ask their questions. Great. Tom, if you want to cover the other resources. So if you signed in um, on arrival, I will email you this presentation so you can share it with those that um, might need it and for your own information as well. Um, and here's some information about some other resources and concerning the courts. And we also have a representative, Ms. Kelly, in the back. Um, she is with Neighborhood Legal Services. Um, you can speak to her afterwards if you have any questions about any specific issues um, or any um, partner issues as well. Um, next slide, please. I did want to encourage everyone to go to our website. You will find, we're videotaping tonight, so you'll find the video of tonight's workshop on our website if you want to see it again or you want to share it with anyone. And we have tons of information about the court system and about the upcoming judicial elections, the candidates who are running for common police court and statewide positions. So any information you need about the courts Think Pennsylvanians for modern courts. Additionally, in the coming year, we will be involved in Pittsburgh expanding our efforts here. So we will be looking for new partners um, to hold workshops at community organizations, community centers. So if you're interested, um, you can, uh, I believe that there are some of my cards over on the table. If they're not, you can come and see me. Exchange contact information, and we're also looking for volunteers to expand our other branches of PMC and community, such as PMC watches, to start going into courts and observing the proceedings, um, and as well as PMC listens. So, thank you. And for the court watchdog program, as I said at the beginning, we do train you to do that. So if it's something that you're interested in doing and you're feeling maybe a little nervous about doing it, have no fear. We have a training program. We can walk you through the whole process and um, instruct you on how to use our evaluation form. And I think people who do it find it very enlightening and, and fun. Oftentimes volunteers go together and it's, it's just a chance to have your eyes on the court and share your impressions with us and with other Pennsylvanians. So thank you all. You were wonderful tonight. We're thrilled that you were here. We are so grateful to Carol and to all of you and to the judge. So.